Do you think this election, which is coming up in the US between Trump and Kamala, do you think it matters? Every election matters in the United States because it's the most powerful country in the world and it's the leader of the Western world and also because the gap between those two candidates is so vast. The gap in terms of their political views and in terms of what they would do with the country, in terms of their perspectives, their attitudes, yes, I think is very important. Do you, for the woke, um, the eradication of the sort of woke virus that you, you speak of, um, do you think one candidate is more likely to achieve that than the other? It's very hard to say because Kamala has said a lot of things that are woke. Um, and she certainly would allow that side to flourish more. Then again, if Donald Trump gets elected, does that provoke even more of a woke backlash? Because, um, you know, the woke narrative is America is racist and homophobic and sexist and whatever. And when Donald Trump gets elected, that kind of reinforces their ideas about reality and they double down. So I don't know the reality. I'm much more concerned about the war in Ukraine. I think that that needs to be resolved. Uh, I have a lot of family in Ukraine. I really care about what happens there. Your wife is Ukrainian? And my wife's Ukrainian. My mother's Ukrainian. I spent my summers as a kid on my granddad's farm in Ukraine. My grandmother, 95 years old, still alive, lives 100 kilometers from the front line, can't leave. She lived through the Nazi occupation and wow. now this. Um, but more importantly for the West, I think it's a real test of uh, the West's resolve. And that issue needs to be resolved by someone, I have said from day one, Ukraine would have to give something away for long-term security because there's no winning this war. Which candidate is more likely to end the war? Well, Kamala, I, look, there's two ways to play this, right? And both of them have merits. One way is you give the Ukrainians way more support than we're currently doing so they can actually make advances. That's one way to handle it. The other way is you accept where we are and you say to Putin, You've got two choices, my friend. One is we do a deal that's fair to you and that's fair to the Ukrainians. And the most important thing is that the Ukrainians get long-term security. That means, because you remember in 2014, this has already happened. Russia already bit a piece off Ukraine in 2014. And by, even at that point, Ukraine had security guarantees from Western countries, which were not executed on. Right, they were not delivered on. We promised them safety and we didn't give them safety. So the most important thing in this outcome is that there's a physical barrier between Ukraine and Russia so that this can't happen again. So either that's membership of NATO, not gonna happen, or more likely some kind of Korean style demilitarized zone with peacekeeping troops on the border, right? If you don't want to do that, Vladimir, then we will give Ukraine everything. That's the threat. That's the deal you have to do. Out of the two candidates, I think Donald Trump is probably more likely to get that outcome. Uh, it's not to say I like everything about Donald Trump, but on that particular issue, I think he would be the, the candidate I would put more faith in to sort it out. Who's doing the brainwashing? A lot of it has been happening in academia since the 60s. So educators uh, who were uh, being encouraged and funded and supported by my boys from the Soviet Union at the time to demoralize the West. They encouraged a lot of these Marxists. And one of the things we haven't yet touched on is um, the ideology of wokeness is really a new form of Marxism. It's a kind of race Marxism. I know this sounds like very abstract and crazy. I don't know if it does to you, but maybe to many people in your audience. So perhaps yeah. I can lay it out a little bit. Can you explain what Marxism is well? Sure. Yeah. So Marxism was an ideology created obviously by Karl Marx and Engels who, who funded him and assisted him. And the idea was very simple. Uh, the idea was that the way to understand human society is through the lens of oppression. We, we've talked about this before, right? There are some people who are the oppressors and some people who are oppressed. Who are the oppressors in Marx's original idea? The oppressors were the bourgeois, the capitalists, the people who owned what he called the means of production, the factories, the, the capital, the stock. Like you are, you are now a a member of the bourgeoisie, a capitalist, you are in a business, right? And what he said was that you are oppressing your producer and everyone who works for you because you take their labor and you profit from it without giving them back the right amount of value in exchange. Um, and by the way, just like with a lot of these other ideas, it was true in the sense that Marxism really is a reaction to the rampant 
abuse that was caused by the Industrial Revolution, in which, you know, you had people sleeping in factories and chimney sweeps that were 12 years old, up chimneys, you know, dying, all of that, right? So as with all of these ideas, there is a kernel of truth. But what he said, and, you know, the people who really practiced this idea the most were the Soviets and the Chinese communists is, well, how do you solve this problem? Oh, very simple. you got to take from the oppressors and you've got to give to the oppressed from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. However, the problem is, it turns out that communism is effectively a great idea at the family level. Like, your family is a communist society, so is mine. Like, I go out to work, I earn money, we spend it together on the needs of my wife, my children, blah, blah, blah. That's communism, right? We share what one productive person produces. Other people do other jobs, they may not be paid as well, blah, blah, blah. The level of society doesn't really work because people are self-interested and to make them not self-interested, to make them all give up everything for the needs of the state and of other people, you have to use a lot of force, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why you have to kill 50 million people in Russia, 50 million people in China to even make it happen. Now, what happened was, you got to remember, this is very important, people forget this. When the Soviet Union was created, it was not designed to be a country-wide phenomenon. The communists believed that the only, rightly, by the way, that the only way communism would work is if you made everyone in the world communist. Because if you made everyone communist, then no one could look at over the border and look at these evil capitalists having a great life. Everyone would be equally poor and then they'd be happy. That was the idea, right? Um, and so the idea of the, the Russian revolution wasn't about making Russia communists, communist. It was about making the world communist. It was the world revolution. That's why the Soviet Union, the, 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 the symbolism of the Soviet Union, it never had anything to do with Russia or the Soviet Union on the flag. It had the globe and the hammer and sickle. The point was this ideology was meant to spread to the entire world. The problem was that when people saw what was actually happening in the Soviet Union, they really didn't want that. And most of all, people in Western societies, including the working class, who were supposed to be the oppressed and to overthrow their oppressive people, they didn't want that. They just wanted to have a nice life and to have a house and to blah, blah, blah. Um, and so the Marxists in the West, they very quickly realized that this wasn't going to work. Western working class people were not going to overthrow the existing regime and have a, a Soviet-style revolution where they slaughter all the bourgeois and the capitalists. So they had to find a different way to approach it which is why they invented this form of race Marxism. They said, no, no, you're not, no, you're not really oppressed because you're working class and you don't have capital. The reason you're oppressed is you're a man, you're gay, you're black, you're this, you're that. And that really landed with people, particularly multi-ethnic societies like ours, where we have a lot of people from minority backgrounds. Um, it coincided with the sexual revolution. I know you've had my friend Louise Perry on the show. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you talked about this, but the pill basically changes the relationship between men and women. Women are liberated, so now a lot of this stuff also happens. And so what happened in the 60s is a lot of educators in academia started teaching these ideas to students. And then you have successive generations of people who are now essentially trained to think that our societies were bad, uh, what they were was about oppression, racism, bigotry, imperialism, uh, colonialism, slavery, etc. Uh, which all of these things have a kernel of truth, and that kernel of truth is used to tell gigantic lies. And because I, because often when we we talk about this division that's happening internally within the West, mm. we think of it as the other side of doing it. But a second ago, you really pointed at forces far afield. Are tinkering, and actually, there was a story this week, I think, or last week, where a podcaster mm -hmm. has been, I think, like arrested and had her channels deleted because it turns out I didn't go deep into the story. She hasn't been arrested, but oh, yes. okay. uh, perhaps I can just summarize sure, it please. quickly. So there was a company in America called Tenet Media who were given ten million dollars in a very short period of time. So I'm sure it would have been more by a Russia Today affiliated. Uh, influencers and various nefarious actors from Russia effectively to uh, disseminate certain types of information through right-wing influences in America. And this has been happening for decades. There's a guy called Yuri Bezmenov. If you're not familiar with him, this guy's going to blow your mind. You should look him up. He was a Soviet defector uh, in the 80s who came uh, from the Soviet Union to India to Canada, ended up in America. He gave a series of lectures, which people can watch on YouTube, about what the 
Soviet intelligence services were actually focusing on. Because during the Cold War, you might not remember this, but you know, people thought about Soviet spies as like stealing microfilms of American nuclear installations and all of this stuff. Actually, what he said was almost all of their resources were used on what he called demoralization. And demoralization is the process whereby you divide society and you activate nefarious forces within that society against the society. So you encourage forces that are destabilizing. This is one thing that people don't understand about Russian misinformation, disinformation, influence operations, etc. They're not designed to get a specific person elected. This is how British people and Americans think. They're like, you know, well, I invest $10 million to get this outcome. It's not what they do. What they want is to create a cacophony of lies so that you don't know what to believe anymore. Is this true? Is that true? And so they were, they are and were and have always been paying people in the West or using people in the West to sow discord, to divide people against each other, to say uh, the Soviet Union, by the way, was very active in, in funding militant uh, African-American groups uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s in America. And in fact, whenever people would say to uh, the Soviets, well, look, you're like starving millions of people and putting them in gulags. By the they would say, well, what about black people in America? They're, you don't treat them well, right? So who are you to tell us about all of this stuff? So, by the way, this isn't like a, a unique thing. Like America does this too. America funds liberal organizations in Russia to get Russian liberals to act in their interest. This is what all civilizations do. I'm just saying maybe we should protect our civilization from this foreign influence. So yes, uh, foreign forces are at play, but you can't, like, no, I, I don't know, I imagine there's no amount of money that people could give you to spread Russian propaganda on this show. There's no amount of money that people could give me to spread Russian propaganda or Chinese propaganda on my show. What they do is they find people who already agree with them, and then they amplify their voice using money and influence and say, look, We'll, we'll, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you $10 million and you can come to this great conference. We'll, we'll give you an opportunity to interview this guy who's close to Vladimir Putin or, or this guy who says this or that person or this person. And they, they just take the forces within our society that are already destabilizing and they amplify them. So this podcaster in the United States, it was Tenant Media. Is yes. that one podcaster? Is that a network of podcasts? So what happened is they had a network of podcasters underneath them who as according to the indictment, they were all being used. So they didn't know they were being paid by Russia. Ah, okay. Uh, they were just all being used. And every now and again, as, again, we don't know the full details, but it would be like, hey, have you seen this new story? Like the Ukrainians might have been involved in the terrorist attack in Russia. Maybe you should cover it. And one of them did. Stuff like that. Ah, okay. And they weren't necessarily picking a side. Were they? No, they were picking a side. Oh, so they were pro-Trump or pro-Kamala or... Well, they were mostly right-wing influencers, mm -hmm. uh, but the person in question, whose name is Lauren Chen, she actually started agitating people against Donald Trump at one point, which is my point. They are not trying to get a particular person elected. They are trying to make you go, well, who do I vote for? What's going to, like, just to, to confuse everybody to the point that they don't know what to believe and they don't know what to think and they don't know what to do. Looks like it's working. That's my point, which is why we need in the West to have a very clear idea of who we are, where we're going, how we got here, what makes our society successful, where we've come from, and to reject the lies about our history. Because this is why uh, both the crazy left and the crazy right want to revise our history so that we don't know who we are anymore. So that we can't say, well, actually, Britain is a great country and has done incredible things for the world, right? Uh, you know, Britain is a country that has the first modern parliament. It's a country that spread democracy around. It's a country that actually, the first empire in history that ended slavery. It ended slavery. It, it didn't invent it. It ended it. Slavery was the norm. And then the British came along, practiced slavery just like everybody else, and a terrible thing it was. And then they spent a tremendous amount of blood, money, and treasure to end slavery, not only within the British empire. They spent a huge amount of diplomatic, military, and financial capital to, for, to force other countries to end slavery in those countries as well, right? But that's not what you're being taught in school right now, is it? No. And, and that's the problem, because if you think of your society as based on these terrible things, well, why would you want its values to persevere and continue in, in the future?
it made me wonder if there is any help or any solution to this, because immediately as I was thinking, is there a way to stop the division? And most of the division actually happens on the internet now. It's not yeah. like we're out in the streets. Mm -hmm. And the way the algorithms work is they reinforce an opinion. So you get literally like coins at the casino for saying something where a big group of people clap. Mm -hmm. And nuance is like the enemy of social media growth, I think. Mm -hmm. Like if you if like if you express a solution to a problem as complex and nuanced, mm -hmm. who the fuck who the fuck wants to hear a complex and nuanced? Like really, the, the, I think there's much more reward for me to say, this is bad. Yes. Or this is amazingly good. Yes. And if you're in either of those camps, you know exactly who's clapping. Yes. Whereas in the middle, as we've kind of you probably experience it a lot as a podcaster, um, like you don't get the support, the full support of either mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe the middle exists, I don't know. The, well, the center is the place of greatest tension. It right. always is because you're getting fire from both sides. Yeah. Uh, and picking a tribe is always much more comfortable and more convenient. But this is where I think actually the beauty of the internet is too. Like 20 years ago, you and I both would have had some kind of rich funder, not me or you, but someone who actually had loads of money, who would be funding this and telling you what you were supposed to talk about. I don't have to give a shit what anyone thinks. There is an audience out there for the nuanced, balanced, here's the thing I think about this, but also about this take. And, you know, look, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you're Andrew Tate, you're going to get a bigger audience saying what you're saying or the equivalent of, of the left, whatever that looks like, uh, than I might. But yeah, I'm very happy with a million subscribers on YouTube. I'm very happy that 60,000 people read my Substacks every week. And that's growing too. There is a market out there for everybody. And then ultimately, if I, it, I think it comes down to is, who are you? And who do you want to be? I didn't get into this to be the richest or the most successful podcaster in the world. I got into this because I wanted to promote critical thinking. I wanted to promote the truth and the pursuit of truth. I don't claim to know the truth, but I'm trying to find out what it is. Um, and I wanted people in the West to remember what they have, to be grateful for it, to defend it, uh, to stand up for the values that made these societies great. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.